Everybody ready? Yes. Here we go. We're here in a matter of state versus Christopher Clements, cause number Sierra 2018 3978. Council, please announce your presence. Tracy Miller and Chris Ward appearing on behalf of the state. Judge, the victims are present this morning and they are going to want to address the court for sentencing. Very well. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Eric Kessler and Jody Roberto. Or Mr. Clements is present in custody. Good morning. All right, this is the time set for sentencing. Is there any legal reason we cannot proceed, Council? No, Your Honor. Very well. Um, <clears throat> tell me your name, please. Christopher Clements. What's your date of birth? Do you have any drugs, medication, or alcohol in the last 24 hours or anything that might make it difficult for you to understand the nature of these proceedings? No. Very well. Today is the day for sentencing. Um, what's going to happen is the state will go first. If any of the victims wish to address the court, they may. Then your lawyer, uh, either Mr. Kessler or Mr. Dave Roberto, will address the court. If you want to say anything, you may, but you don't have to. There's no obligation that you address the court, but it is a right called allocution. Very well. Ms. Miller. Judge, I would ask that Mr. and Mrs. Sellis be allowed to address the court at this time. Very well. And it's my understanding, we do have a camera, a camera in the courtroom, and it's my understanding that they uh, wish not to be put on camera, and the cameraman knows that. Correct, Mr. Cameraman? I'm getting the thumbs up. Very well. Thank you, okay. Where are you more comfortable, Mrs. Mrs. So is she more comfortable over there? Yeah. Not being up at the podium, it can be it can be daunting. So if you want to stay over there, yeah, why don't you, that's fine. Good morning. Good morning. Um, what is it you'd like me to know? Um, and you know what? I was we have all day. Yeah. Just so you know, and literally we have all day. I have nothing else on my calendar. You take your time. If you want to take a break, we'll adjourn and come back. All right. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, the actions of this man have caused so much pain and suffering to so many children and families, including my daughter, Isabel, my boys, my husband, me, and my fam our families and friends. Isabel's favorite place in the world was home, and he ruined that for her, for her brothers, for us, her parents. We could never see that place as home again. He took Isabel's childhood away from him, from her, along with my boy's childhood. His actions caused so many events of anguish, heart rate, heartache, accusations, scornfulness towards my family that we had to endure. His actions took Isabel from her brothers. He took away a beautiful life presence. He, we will never get to see her grow into a beautiful woman to watch her grow up, graduate high school, go to college, get married, and all the things we will never get to do with her. Christopher took her and killed her. In my opinion, Christopher has no remorse, no feelings for his actions. He has hurt countless children and families, including Isabel, Maribel, my boys, my family. His punishment should be natural life and no parole. The problem is he will do everything to cheat the system through appeals to get away with all his crimes and maybe one day he will succeed. My solace is knowing in the Bible in the Bible there is a verse in Matthew. If anyone abuses or hurts one of these little children, these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him to have a heavy boulder tied around his neck and be hurled into the deepest sea than to face the punishment he deserves. The Bible speaks of God's wrath, and it has been shown to be great. He has hurt many, many little ones, including my baby girl, Isabel. Punishment in this world will never be enough for the amount of pain and suffering he has caused. God, karma, Mother Earth, whatever you believe in, all of this has a way of making things right that no one can escape. Christopher Clemens should get natural life to have time to process God's wrath that is unescapable. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Sellis. She'd be proud of you. Mr. Sellis, good morning. Good morning. Ready to go? If you need a break, we can do the same thing. The same offer I made to your, to your wife. Your Honor, when the prosecution brought to us the death penalty that was on the table initially in this case, they asked us how we felt about that. 
We both didn't, we both felt that it, we didn't have the say of who lives or dies. Clearly, there are others that feel above that. The death penalty was off the table. We, my son Julian, said to me, Becky, and myself, we all are going to serve a life sentence of this unescapable, never-ending nightmare. Myself, until the day I die, I will feel responsible for not doing my job and protecting my little girl from the evil that lurked outside her window. Please hear my wife's words. Let justice prevail, Judge. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. You as well. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Miller, State Secretary. Thank you, Judge. Before I start with that, Judge, um, Julian and Sergio Miguel, the brothers, are not able to be here today. As part of this case, back in the very early days, Julian Sellis wrote a letter to his little sister, and they've asked that I share that with you to give you some perspective on what this 10-year-old boy was experiencing at the time that his sister was abducted. Dear Isabel, I love Can you. Can I interrupt a moment? Yes. I have a copy of for you. Oh, did you get the copy of Julian? No, but go ahead and read it. But it's a tough read, Miss Miller. And if you want to bail out. Judge, I think for Julian and the family, I will get through this if your honor's okay with it. Absolutely. Dear Isabel, I love you with all my heart. I really miss you, and I want you to come home to us. I'm really sorry for being mean to you. I want you to come home so that I can treat you with more respect and more kindness. I wish that this never happened. I miss you being kind to me. I now know that when you were very nice to me, that I was mean to you, that that was not fair. I wish I could tell you how sorry I am to you. I love that you loved me very much. I'm very sorry that I acted like I didn't even love you. I wish that this never happened to you because now that you left, I've been wanting to go look for you when I found out that you were kidnapped. I cried so much. I am very sorry that this happened to you. I'm hoping that we find you soon because I miss you very much. I wish that you were home right now. Whoever took you, have mercy on him or her. I hope you come home safe. By the time you come home, I will cry very much. I will be very happy. I will cry so much because you come home. I will hug you. Make sure that nobody comes and takes you again. This person that took you hopefully gets in big trouble. I love you with all my heart. Judge, the state is asking for a term of natural life consecutive to the natural life sentence this court imposed on Maribel Gonzalez's murder. You have this defendant's criminal history which is detailed in the pre-sentence report. I will say, and I know that probation is busier than I've ever seen them judge. I know the PSR notes that they were not able to get a hold of the advocates or reach the Sellis family. For the record, and your honor knows, they are here all the time. They've sat through two trials. Um, they address the court today. Yeah. So um, just for purposes of the record, I wanna make sure that that portion of the PSR is, is corrected or reflected. You have had a chance to see this defendant's criminal history, not just here 
um, but the many priors that he has for burglaries in Maricopa mm -hmm. County. <clears throat> You had additional letters that family and friends submitted to your honor to consider and review. What is most prominent in aggravation is the emotional harm that the Salas family endured in this case. April 21st is coming up in just a couple of weeks. I saw something this morning where the sentencing meant closure for this particular case and perhaps for the community who's watched for the last decade. The abduction, the five years that it took before Isabel was found, and the sentencing here today may bring some closure. It is never going to be closure for this family. And you heard Sergio and Becky address you today, her brothers who've also been here. What was ripped from them, what was stolen from them on the morning of April 21st, can never be replaced. Whatever sentence you impose for this defendant will never replace Isabel to her family and friends. I don't believe there's any mitigation this defendant can proffer that would outweigh the aggravation, his criminal history, and certainly the emotional impact to the Sellis family. But the record in this case, Judge, does reflect something else about Christopher Clemens' state of mind and who he is. When we did the suppression motion for his statements and the state asked her to introduce his statements, those weren't things that the state introduced at the time of trial. Those statements we elected not to introduce. But in those statements, what we know is that in February, he asked the FBI to come see him at the Pima County Jail. Contained within those statements that are part of the record in this case is him talking with the FBI and leading them to believe in 2017 that Isabel could still be alive. He wouldn't tell them initially whether she was alive or dead. And then the FBI comes back a second time and he outright says that she's alive. All this at a time when he is trying to get something, burglary charges dismissed, a car back, additional charges in Maricopa County dismissed or dropped. That's when he chose after five years of suffering for the Salas family and friends he chose to come forward at a time when it was all about him. And then he led the police to believe that she could still be alive in an attempt to speed up the process for him. Not only did his conduct in this case deprive the Sellis family of their daughter forever, his actions are unconscionable and horrific. The court might remember that in the first trial, Becky Sellis took the stand, and one of the things that she talked about was how every year in those five years that they didn't know where Isa was, they bought birthday presents and Christmas presents. They stayed in that family home, and they waited for her with the hopes that she would be alive. The one man who knew that she was dead the morning after he took her, waited until there was an opportune time for him. That in and of itself, Judge, his conduct, his behavior, reflects absolutely no remorse, completely unconscionable. It's difficult to imagine what the Sellis family does after today in leaving this courtroom. But I imagine it looks very much like the life that they've been living since April 21st of 2012. All of the things that they will never get to experience with their daughter, but have every right to. 
the unimaginable nightmare is something that will they'll never wake up from. The person responsible for all of that is Christopher Clements. And we're asking, Your Honor, that he spend the rest of his natural life in prison for Isabel's abduction and murder. We're asking that you impose maximum sentences for both the kidnapping and burglary counts, and that you run that count, the natural life sentence, consecutive to Maribel Gonzalez, which is also consecutive to the 20 years he's serving in Maricopa County. Ms. Miller, I appreciate your thoughts. I do have a question. <coughs> um, you're asking for maximum on uh, count two and count three. <coughs> I don't remember that we had an aggravating phase uh, in trial. Am I not um, limited to the presumptive? You, you are, Judge, and I apologize for that. It also is going to run concurrent to the natural life sentence. So. Okay, I, I, and I know why is he up there picking this, but. No, you're absolutely right, and for purposes of the record. We all know yes. how important um, that absolute compliance in, uh, with applicable statutes is warranted. So I, I, yes. I just want to make sure I wasn't missing something. You're not missing anything, Judge. That's my mistake in circling the pre-sentence no, report no, on those numbers. But you're right. It has to be the presumptive sentence. Um, yes, and concurrent to the natural life. That's why lawyers are called counselors. I look to you <laughs> for guidance as you throughout these trials. I look to all of you for guidance many times. So thank you, Judge. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Eric, are you going to do the I, yeah, Before I, I hear from you, um, ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. and Mrs. Sellis and uh, the family and support, um, Mr. Kessler, I believe, is going to address the court. Uh, he's going, uh, I, I've, I've gotten to know, well, uh, all, all four of the lawyers pretty well, as you can imagine. And um, I never had the opportunity to work with Mr. Kessler before this case, and um, I, I'm, I'm glad I got to know him. Uh, he's an honorable guy. Um, he does a hard job. He does it well, and he does it again, with honor. So. But he's got a job to do, and his job is to advocate for Mr. Clements. And in doing so, uh, he may say some things that are tough to hear. He may say some things that will anger you. You may start thinking, I hate that guy. Well, he's a terrible man, and that's completely unfair. Because he's not, he's a very good man. But that doesn't mean you won't have those emotions. So. I'm going to make an offer. If you'd like, you can step outside and um, I'll hear from Mr. Kessler. And then as soon as he's done, I'll have my bailiff go get you and you can be present for the balance of the sentence. The choice is yours. And if you want to stay now, but if it gets a little rough and you want to leave, you won't disturb anything, you won't disturb me or the process. Feel free to get up and leave. And again, my bailiff will come out and get you. The choice is yours. Mr. Kessler. Thank you. May I use the photo? Absolutely. Thank you, Your Honor, and, and thank you for those comments. I I really appreciate that. Um, it, it's been a pleasure trying both of these cases in your courtroom. Um, I, I don't have a lot to say. I I, I have some observations and, and maybe the court can um, find room to consider them in deciding whether you know whether to impose a, a natural versus a um, so-called regular life sentence. Um, because of the date of the crime and the nature of the jury's verdict and the count that we received on the homicide um, conviction, uh, the court does have the legal option to impose a life sentence. I think um, I, I would have a tough time disagreeing with uh, Miss Miller, that it has to be, or, or to suggest 
that that it would be other than consecutive to the Maribel Gonzalez case. I think it has to be. But um, first, let me let me tell you this. I I've been doing this for, and I want the Salas family to be aware of this as well. I've been practicing for 41 years exclusively in criminal law, and I have pretty much limited my practice to death penalty cases since maybe 1990. And during that time, I have represented more than 30 individuals charged with first degree murder, where the government has elected to seek the death penalty. And that was the case here, and that's why I was asked to take the case. Um, and then was asked to continue after the death penalty was withdrawn. I cannot think of a sadder, um, um, more depressing case than this. What happened to Isabel? And, and I, I'm sure I'm, I'm speaking for the entire defense team. This was hard for us. Um, we worked six years on this case. And every time we got together, which was very frequently, um, somebody always mentions this is the worst that they had seen. But that's part of the problem, I think, for Mr. Clements in this case. Um, there was an email provided, I believe, to Ms. Miller who then provided it to the court and, and to the defense that actually came from a juror in this case. Uh, it was not a bad email. Um, it was rather, rather kind. But what I found interesting was exactly what Mr. Di Roberto and I were concerned about. The juror mentioned that when he or she saw the bones of Isabel, that they became angry. And the way I read that email, and knowing what they were seeing for the first time, because I at one point saw it for the first time in this case, um, my concern was that there was going to be a verdict based on emotion um, and that it didn't matter who was sitting over there for the defense. Mr. Clements's goose was cooked at that point. We had a lot of litigation um, over the years about um, venue and to this day I, I feel strongly, and this is, you know, an argument to be made at a different level. Um, but I, I felt strongly that it just, because of human nature, um, it was unlikely that Mr. Clements was going to have 12 um, unbiased jurors. Just, when Mr. Di Roberto and I finished our presentation of the case. We, we, you know, we talked about it. What it would be right, what it would be wrong. We felt that we had done our job and not only established reasonable doubt, but maybe gone beyond that and actually proven um, at some burden that Mr. Clements was not the one who was responsible for this. 
But when the jury verdict came back, it was nothing other than I expected. He's guilty. I didn't expect a different result. I didn't expect a different result when I was engaged in Lord Dyer at the beginning of the trial. Um, I just didn't feel like it mattered what we did. It's a very unique case. Um, it was also a very circumstantial case. And as I argued to the jury in my closing, in order for the state to stitch together all the circumstances that it really needed to, um, to show that circumstantially, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, Mr. Clements is responsible for this crime, there were so many real iffy layers to that. So many areas where uh, it could have happened so many different ways. And because of the circumstantial nature of the case, if any one of those layers was not proven beyond a reasonable doubt, I, I didn't see how it could go any further. But it did, and I wasn't surprised. But for purposes of sentencing, I, I, I think the court should consider that. Um, sometimes it, it's referred to as reasonable or residual doubt. Um, I think it's present here. Um, additionally, Mr. Um, Mr. Clements is serving two lengthy sentences in Maricopa County and is already serving a natural life sentence with a consecutive kidnapping sentence on the Maribel Gonzalez case. There's case law that suggests that facing that kind of a, a series of, of sentencings uh, might be considered uh, a reason to show some mercy at this point and just sentence him to life. Uh, we certainly don't believe that the court can sentence him based on uh, the felony murder rule and uh, 13116 that they could, the court has the legal authority to sentence him to consecutive sentences within these three counts. Because if you take away what needed to be proved in order to prove up the homicide, we're left with nothing else. They had to prove, the state had to prove a kidnapping, they had to prove a burglary. Uh, that was the theory of their case. And in order to be able to prove up the homicide. And under 13116, I think that, that precludes the court from, from running any of these three sentences consecutively. And I may have missed something from Ms. Miller, but I didn't hear her ask I didn't hear the state ask for consecutive sentences. You did Among these three? Am I right, Ms. Miller? Oh, okay. No, Judge, they, they, I agree with Mr. Kessler. They do have to be concurrent within... Because I was going to give you an opportunity yeah. to be aggressive. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, and so I, I'm so sorry um, for the Salas family and, and the ripple effects through the Sellis family. I wish that there was something I could do about that, but there isn't. But it's that emotion that I fear is what doomed Mr. Clements, regardless of what the evidence was. And I think if the court takes an objective view um, of, of the evidence and the fact that this was necessary layers of circumstantial evidence, none of which 
I think reasonable minds could say was proof beyond a reasonable doubt of each level, each layer. Um, there is sufficient doubt here to show leniency and um, sentence Mr. Clements to natural life, or not natural life, to life. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Clements, is there anything you wish to say? There is. disturbingly ironic that at the nascence of each of the last three trials in which I've been a defendant in, in this court, Mr. Martyr, you have in baronial locution lectured the jury about the importance of the fair trial being afforded to every citizen of this country. <clears throat> you stress to the jurors that if these rights so enshrined in our Constitution are not adhered to, quote, we are lost, unquote using Joseph Stalin's show, Trials of the Soviet Area, you attempted to illustrate Trials of the United States' nomenclature as being diametric to the iniquitous nature of those conducted at the behest of the late Russian dictator. Mr. Marner, I'm unsure if you were simply repeating some platitude you gleaned from law school or the History Channel in an effort to embellish the verisimilitude of your court. Or if you were offering a tacit acknowledgement that the proceedings there too overseen by your predecessor and from that point to jury deliberation overseen by yourself would be anything but fair. <clears throat> Either way, all three trials that I've endured in your court would have no doubt made any Soviet chairman of the Council of People's Commissars proud. It's inconceivable how any person with even a semblance of pragmatism or objectivity could call what just happened a fair trial. Mr. Martyr, maybe you believe, like countless others, that a trial is fair so long as it takes place in the United States. Or maybe, also like countless others, you don't practice what you preach and instead embrace the ever-growing ideology that the end justifies the means and all else in between is nothing but ceremony. With alacrity, you saw that these trials took place even though the case was saturated with substantive rulings left by a judge, your predecessor, who was found to be biased by the Judicial Conduct Commission. You did not even look at these rulings unless, of course, doing so would benefit the prosecution. You denied a change of venue even in light of the fact that this city's collective media had chose to supplant calumny for veracity and propagate guilt into the community's minds long before these trials ever even commenced. And it was you, Mr. Marner, specious champion of the American citizen's right to a fair trial, that actually had the temerity to commiserate with jurors after a hung jury and inform them of my record and previous conviction begotten in your court. You assured those jurors that I would not be getting out of prison. Your sentiments and bias went from your very mouth to those hung jurors and from them to the media. And the media, our so-called fourth estate, didn't hesitate to put what you said to those jurors into print and television as cannon fodder for the next jury. Your actions helped ensure that a guilty verdict in the next trial was all but certain. The trials and the hearings leading up to them are the best examples of confirmation bias I've ever seen. And I've read a lot of books about village hangings carried out by the Crown in the Middle Ages, Hitler's fascist government, Pol Pot and his ruthless Khmer Rouge regime, and yes, Joseph Stalin's purges and show trials. I still maintain my innocence, even if such innocence has never been presumed by anyone in this court or the community in which it operates, other than my attorneys and maybe a few people too afraid to utter such an outre belief. Though this experience has tested my trust in the American justice system, I still believe in this system constructed by our founding fathers. It's not perfect and those good men knew as much. They knew that injustices and unfairness of courts like King George's and in countries like Spain and France could insidiously make their way onto American soil. It's one of the reasons why we have appeals, Mr. Martin, because of judges like you. Maybe in your next perennial discourse to a jury about what isn't a fair trial, you should contemplate using the trials I endured in you and your predecessor's courtrooms as an exemplar instead of Stalin's 
slightly fair kangaroo hearings. In closing, I'll quote your words, Mr. Marner, words that eerily mirror those of a German journalist who watched in dismay as men in brown shirts lurked toward the newspaper she worked at in Berlin circa 1934. Quote, we are lost, unquote. Okay. Jeff, would you give Mr. Mr. Sells? <coughs> Mr. Kessner, anything further from the defense? No, Your Honor. Thank you.
just need any clarification for its ruling. Not of your ruling, Judge. No, Your Honor. Thank you. Very well. Mr. Clements, uh, you can challenge what I did by filing a notice of appeal. It must be filed within 20 days of today's date. Anybody need to make any further record on anything? I do, Judge. I would ask... Oh, restitution? I forgot about restitution. I, I don't think that anyone is asking for restitution in this case. So, if you want to leave it open, Judge... I'm going to leave restitution open for a period of one year from today's date. Thank you, Your Honor. During Mr. Kessler's comments, he referenced an um, email that I had received from a juror. Um, I, I don't agree with the comments he made. I think it was exactly to the contrary. So I'm going to ask that that be made part of the record, even if the court wants to put it under seal. Oh, very well. And it was uh, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I hadn't already filed that under seal. I don't know, Judge. I know that there were a series of things. But just for purposes of the record, I want to make sure that that email is included. Um, I was thinking the exact same thing when, um, when Mr. Kessler was making that comment. What I will do is, um, I think my J is in here somewhere. Do we have a copy of that email? Yes, sir. Okay. So what I will do is uh, I will file that email under seal. Any objection, Mr. Kessler, Mr. David Burton? No, you're not. Yeah, and I will file it under seal and have it be uh, part of the record. Um, and it can be subject to appellate review. Thank you, Judge. And that's a good thought. Thank you. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Anything else? Nothing As I said earlier, um, and this is for the lawyers, uh, it's a pleasure working with professionals. So thank you for your camaraderie and uh, your assistance, and um, I'm proud of you, both sides. Thank you. Okay, and unless we have anything else, we're adjourned. Thank you all. All right, well, thank you for staying on this live stream and for joining us for this episode of Unscripted on 13 Plus. Again, hearing the sentence in the Christopher Clements case today for the m kidnapping and murder of Isabel Sellis and definitely um, kind of what the family wanted to see in this case. He was sentenced to natural life without parole for the murder charge in that case. Kidnapping was another charge, um, 17 years for that, and then three and a half years for the burglary charge in this case. So that will be served consecutively to the life sentence that he's already serving for the murder of Maribel Gonzalez and the sentence that he's facing right now in Maricopa County as well. So hearing from Christopher Clements as well in court today, and I know that we talk about this all the time, me and Tyler, just kind of how I watch true crime. And it was interesting hearing from him because he kind of attacked the judge, came after the justice system, system um, everything that happened in all of his different trials, and never once mentioned Maribel Gonzalez or Isabel Clements, not once during his statements. Uh, uh, yeah, so in his statement was so full of multi-syllabic words i mean like he was clearly trying to make this impression that he's the smartest guy in the room or one of the smartest people in the room and and portraying himself as the victim of an unjust system here uh, which is not entirely unexpected uh, but it looked like uh, we had a zoom in uh, shot of his note looked like it was a handwritten note he referenced uh comparing this trial to like the kind of stuff that was happening in Nazi Germany under Pol Pot happening uh, under Stalin so that's his take on it he is the victim of this system that had already kind of had this predetermined outcome right that wronged him and now as you mentioned I mean we've got natural life sentence so I was curious what does that mean in Arizona a natural life sentence versus a life sentence there is a difference so a life sentence for him since the victim in this case is under the age of 15 that would mean 35 years without parole. Natural life is what you would think it is. The rest of his natural life. Mm -hmm. There is no 35 years. It's just until the end of his life. So natural life is pretty high up there in terms of the kind of punishments that you could be looking at. Absolutely. And that's already on top of another life sentence. And mm -hmm. then 17 years for kidnapping, three and a half years for burglary. So definitely the outcome. Um, that I think that her family was seeking in this case we heard from them and we will have JD Wallace who was there in the courtroom this morning for sentencing joining us here in a bit once he can get out of that courtroom to kind of bring us more on what he heard from the Sellis family today um, during that sentencing hearing but uh, yeah kind of setting up the notion that he will be filing an appeal that he thought that he was wrong during this entire process and again not once even in cases where people have claimed that they were innocent or didn't do it they've at least acknowledge the hurt caused by the trial um, and the verdict towards yeah, the family. Not a mention of that. Not a mention once of Isabel Salas, and I think that that's been lost in his statement, the fact that 
there is a little girl who is no longer alive, and he didn't once mention her name. No rem remorse for it, even if he's convinced that he had nothing to do with it. Um, you know, some kind of remorse in some way, some expression of sorrow for what they've been going through. Right. Would be Just something. being a human being. Yeah. Um, Instead, I think what we got is ultimately they said, you know, at the end, it's part of the formality. If you want to file appeal, you've got 20 days to do so. He's going to file an appeal, more yeah. than likely. Yeah, uh, he will. But again, a life sentence to be served consecutively to the life sentence that he's already facing. So um, at this point, looking at all of those different sentences, um, he will be in prison the rest of his life. Yeah, so yeah, without a doubt. I think that's the outcome that a lot of people wanted to see in this case. Well, again, we'll have J.D. Wallace joining us here um, in a few minutes once he can get out of the courtroom and he can kind of give us a recap of what he saw today during that sentencing hearing. And, of course, we'll continue to cover this throughout the day, um, the end of what's been so heavy on people's minds and hearts over the past few months and over, you know, the last decade or so because this is actually something that happened almost 12 years to the day of his sentencing. So. And I think, you know, you still want to keep the Salas family in your thoughts and prayers, not just for what they've gone through. If we do wind up going through the appeal process, that just reopens this wound over and over again. Something that this. already ended in a mistrial, like this was not yeah. the second trial. They've had to go through this. Yeah, that they've had to go through. So hopefully this is a chapter that can be closed for them. Um, and obviously there's never any full closure when you lost a child, but just, you know, start the healing process and the healing journey, getting some justice today there in court. So. Yeah. Uh, another thing that, of course, we want to talk about today, because this was a huge story we talked about yesterday, the Supreme Court decision here in Arizona coming down yesterday about the abortion mm -hmm. decision. So this actually was a Civil War era abortion ban. It's been in place. Um, it was put in place originally in 1864 in the state of Arizona. So what does this mean moving forward? The 15 week ban that we had in the state. So after 15 weeks, people could no longer get abortions up until then they could. That is no longer in place. Now it is. Um, that you can only get an abortion if your life is in danger. So the life of the mother is in danger. It bans all abortions, even in cases where there's incest or rape. Um, obviously, very heated discussions on both sides about the outcome um, of this ruling from the Arizona Supreme Court. And the author of the 4-2 to two decision did write, physicians are now on notice that all abortions except those necessary to save a woman's life are illegal so doctors could actually face two to five years mandatory prison sentence if um, they're caught performing an abortion so here's the thing though and I mean other states have hit this wall yeah um, I'm from Oklahoma we've got one of those laws similar there uh, where it's pretty much a complete abortion ban and but there's that exception for saving the life of the mother but at what point does that kick in that has been a big point of contention in all these states that have done this is right. you've heard stories of people that have been like we've been sitting in the emergency room until you know my wife's on the verge of bleeding out until the doctors felt like they had the ability to intervene well in um, texas we've seen yeah. a lot of cases like that too because texas implemented something similar um and people have said you know my life is in danger and I have not been able to get an abortion so it's kind of you know who ultimately makes that call who decides yeah when it becomes truly a matter of life or death with the mother now of course you also need the enforcement at a local level to make that happen and the Attorney General has said that she will not be prosecuting doctors who um, do decide to carry out abortions other sheriff's departments have come forward saying that they're not using their resources to go after doctors in Pima County the attorney Laura Conover has said that her office will not use its limited resources to go after those performing abortions or who are in need so, of health care. I mean, really, you know, you see their doctors face two to five year prison sentence. Extremely unlikely yes. that's going to happen because you've got too many other checks and balances that are not in agreement with this decision. Right. But then I think that it's the fear factor of it, which it's, you know, if they're told that they're not allowed to. That can change with an election. Correct. Which that's the big thing moving forward is that there's been this push to get a measure on the ballot and that has gotten enough signatures. So come November, we will have a ballot measure to enshrine the right to an abortion in our state's constitution now. Obviously, both sides um, pretty heated about this. We saw a local rally here yesterday, people who want to protect abortion access here in the state and people who have said, you know, they've been fighting really hard to make sure that this is something that doesn't happen and that they were happy with that ban. Um, and of course, lawmakers weighing in on it as well. I know that you posted this morning 
Um, so Congressman Siskamani, actually this is on your personal yeah. or your work Facebook so page. So this is, uh, and feel free to jump in here and, and, and chat, it's on my Facebook page. So Juan Siskamani is taking a bit of a hit on social media X and the like because, for example, this is a post that he made back in uh, 2022 when he was running for uh, or, or when this announcement came out that they were going to be overturning Roe versus Wade. So he was calling it a historic day. I applaud the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. These policies should be set by states and by we the people. And then he said, I'm proudly pro-life and will always defend life as a member of Congress. As a husband and father, I believe that life is precious. And as a country, we must protect women and children in every possible way. So you can take that however you'd like. The thing that's conflicting with people here is... This is a statement that came out yesterday from him. Kind of a different tone. Today's mm -hmm. ruling is a disaster for women and providers. In Arizona, our 15-week law protected the rights of women and new life. It respected women and the difficult decision of ending a pregnancy. One I'll never personally experience and won't pretend to understand. As my record shows, I'm a strong supporter of empowering women to make their own health care choices, and I oppose a national abortion ban. Now, that part does line up with his first statement, state by state. The territorial law, he says, archaic, we must do better for women, and I call on our state policymakers to immediately address this in a bipartisan manner. So what he's getting criticism for with this is just the fact that on one hand, you've got a statement that seems very gung-ho about, great, we've eliminated uh, abortion at the national level, I will continue to push this forward in whatever way I can. And then you've got the one yesterday that it's like, whoa, 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 the 15 weeks was was good it gave people time so he's going to be facing a bit of criticism of course it's an election year right. so it's a little bit of you know he's being basically told that he's pandering to people and i think i mean we saw this with nikki haley a lot of people when she was um you know had her campaign for president a lot of people she's conservative says that very openly but then she said you know we need to protect this access to abortion and health care for women and so i think that this is an issue aside from border policies right now that is one of the number one issues that are getting people charged up ahead of the election and people know that there are going to be people who vote for the first time in this country because of this issue specifically. And, and that's not just conjecture. We've been seeing that across the country right. for the last two years now is that this has continued to be an issue that's popped up on the ballots and it's an issue that's continued to be a winner for Democrats in most of these races. Yeah, so definitely um, Coming under fire for that a bit, kind of a change in what he was originally saying and um, what he is now saying. So, uh, yeah, just an issue that we're going to continue to follow, obviously, very closely and kind of the fallout from yesterday's ruling, what happens in the next few weeks, whether or not, um, you know, we see more statements from some of our politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, but something that people are very charged up about on both sides. This is going to be a big thing in November in Abs the state. Absolutely. Come November. And like we said, it's going to be a measure that we're going to see on the ballot. So... Um, of course, we'll continue to follow that for you over the next few weeks. And we do want to go now. We're going to head back to J.D. Wallace, who's outside of the courtroom after that common sentence came down this morning. Um, he has a look at exactly what happened this morning and, you know, hearing from the Salas family, uh, as well as Christopher Clemens, some more on his statement and what he had to say this morning in that sentencing hearing. So we'll go ahead and listen in from what he has to say. Judge James Marner just handed Christopher Clements natural life to be served consecutively to his previous natural life term for the murder of Isabel, excuse me, of Maribel Gonzalez. So Christopher Clements received natural life for the murder of Isabel Sellis, as well as he received sentences for uh, kidnapping and burglary. Um, we, uh, we actually have uh, Eric Kessler here, defense attorney. Uh, to uh, speak with us. And uh, Mr. Kessler, uh, what is the next step now that we understand that uh, Christopher Clements has received natural life? Uh, he will be appealing. I'm handling the appeal on the first, um, the first conviction. Whether I handle this appeal or not is not up to me. I'm certainly willing to do it, uh, but there are powers above me that make that decision. What did you think about the comments that Christopher Clements made to the judge and to the court? Uh, they were, they were uh, based on emotion. Uh, they were pretty powerful. I was not in favor of those comments being made uh, in, in that manner. But uh, Mr. Clements has the right to express himself at a sentencing hearing, and he insisted that... Uh, he wanted to say those things. Was he, was he trying to provoke the judge into doing something that would be misconduct? 
No, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think that you have to understand he's been under indictment for six years. And the first judge we had had to be removed from the case because the Judicial Commission found her to be so biased against him. And that set the stage for a frame of mind that if Chris Clements is tried in uh, Tucson, he's not going to get a fair trial. And I think that, that that really eats at him. And so this was his only time to express those feelings. What basis will you be appealing on with, you know, after us hearing the, the effort to give a fair trial, the fact that Mr. Clemens does not feel like he had one? Well, the, you know, the, the Maribel Gonzalez case is under the same indictment as the Isabel Sellas case. And so many of the arguments that were raised in the appeal on the Maribel Gonzalez case will apply in, in the appeal on this case. But there are some that are unique. There are some issues that are unique to this case, but I don't want to go into the details of those yet. There, there's a strategy that appellate attorneys use as to which issues to appeal. Um, and since I'm not yet the appellate attorney, that decision hasn't been made. And what stage is the Maribel appeal? Uh, the defense has filed a, a lengthy opening brief. The state, through the attorney general, has a few more weeks to file its responsive brief. What, is your, what was your reaction when the Sellers family decided to leave the courtroom when you were going to give your, your statement? Well, I'm, I'm learning from your question that they left. I, I, I did not look behind me, so... Uh, if they left the courtroom, um, that's fine. I, I have nothing but uh, sympathy for that family. Was it difficult to be defending Christopher Clements and, and have to bring up Sergio Sellis in your um, defense of him, saying, you know, telling the jury they have, if Mr. Sellis was complicit in the di disappearance of his daughter, they must find Mr. Clements guilty? You, you're basically having to bring the character of Sergio Celis under fire in front of that jury? Well, I, we certainly did not want to bring his character under fire. We wanted to bring his conduct under fire. And keep in mind, until uh, 2017, when Mr. Clements first came on the radar based on his uh, jailhouse interviews with the FBI, the number one suspect, according to the Tucson Police Department, was Sergio Sr. He was their prime suspect in this case. Um, and so we had to bring him up. And, and at any cost? I mean, well, it's not a question of cost. He's not on trial. Mr. Sellis is not. My job is to raise reasonable doubt. And if I can show that Mr. Sellis, through his con his conduct and the circumstances as we knew them, specifically, how could this young lady have been taken from the house reasonably? Um, that might raise reasonable doubt as to whether Christopher Clements was involved. And that's the reason that we uh, sort of port point the finger at Mr. Mr. Sellis. We're not accusing him of, of doing anything. We're simply informing the jury of these facts that suggest that somebody else might be responsible. Do you believe that you, your client did get a fair trial? I mean, three trials, one missed trial, hmm. two others that said that guilty? The appeal that we filed in the Maribel Gonzalez case challenges whether he received a fair trial. And I suspect that that will be an issue that will be raised in this case as well. What's the challenge defending a case with the facts, the, the layout of facts you have on both of these cases? Young girls disappeared, killed, mm -hmm. all of it. Well, you know, even after 40 years of practice, we don't become so hardened that we aren't sympathetic to, to what happened. Uh, our job is to represent Mr. Clements and uh, not to be his friend, but to be his lawyer and make sure he 
he gets as close to a fair trial as we, we can provide him with. Um, so these types of cases are very difficult because they engender emotions, um, sometimes uh, citywide, like in this case. International. Well, really? yes. With respect to Isabel, that's my understanding. You mentioned an email from a juror that um, mentioned feeling uh, rage when uh, the uh, skeletal remains of Isabel Sellis were shown. Um, it sounds like that's going to be coming up in the appeals on because uh, there was some disagreement about the nature of that email. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not uh, certain what the disagreement was. Uh, Ms. Miller didn't have an opportunity to to tell us what that disagreement was. But the email was pretty clear to me that the juror who wrote the email, whether or not that person was unbiased before uh, being shown Isabel's remains, namely a few bro uh, pieces of bones. Um, after that happened, that created anger, um, and then when you have a juror who's who's acting on those types of emotions, it's difficult for them to be objective. Any final thoughts, sir? Uh, my sympathies to the Sellis family. That's what that's what I walk away from. You mentioned you become a specialist in death penalty cases. Yes. Why did you choose to do that? Uh, death penalty litigation is unique. Not only do we uh, have to defend the charges, but we have to uh, try to preserve the defendant's life. Uh, I, I'm an opponent of the death penalty. I don't think that it should exist, and so I do everything I can to fight it. You do feel this was a fair, fair trial? Do I? Yes. Um, well, what I feel is, is not important, but I understand the question. Uh, the Court of Appeals will probably make that determination. How do you feel about how did Judge Marner conduct this trial is how I should ask that. I know that you're appealing this. Judge Marner is a gentleman, and he's a joy to practice in front of. Thank you, Mr. Chester. Thank you. That's Eric Kessler. He defended Christopher Clements in this trial as well as in the trial of Mary, uh, as well as uh, for the murder of uh, Maribel Gonzalez. And as you heard, Eric Kessler will be appealing the uh, conviction in this trial. Uh, once again, Christopher Clements faces a consecutive life sentence as well as sentences for uh, burglary and kidnapping uh, for the uh, disappearance and death of Isabel Salas. Uh, Becky Salas and Sergio Salas, Isabel Salas' mother and father, both made statements uh, before the court today. Isabel Sal excuse me, Becky Salas, saying that their home no longer felt like a home after this happened, of course, and that she hopes that uh, a she wished that a rock could be tied to Christopher Clements and he be thrown in the deepest sea. Uh, once again, also the uh, the. The entire family says that they've been, of course, struggling. This is not closure, according to uh, Prosecutor Tracy Miller, even though many people consider a sentencing like this to be such. We'll have more coming up on 13 News Live at 3. Reporting live downtown at Pima County Superior Court, J.D. Wallace, 13 News. I have no idea if we were still up on that. During that sentencing hearing, but also hearing from uh, Christopher Clements' attorney on why they will be appealing. Um, Did that sound like a, a judge to you that was very on board with the whole appeal process? Uh, a judge or an attorney? Or an attorney, that is. No, he, did, he, did, he did, did, did not, not sound, I mean, he mentioned he did not want uh, Christopher Clements to give that statement that he gave right. where and I, he I was think ripping the judge. That was the most interesting part of that was that he's like, look, I discouraged my client from giving that statement, but at the end of the day, he felt compelled to, and um, I don't know if it did him any favors. I think that the sentence was probably decided ahead of time in this case, but um, yeah, I mean, that's their job at the end of the day. When you're a defense attorney, that is your job. But you mentioned earlier showing, you know, Clemens showed no remorse in his statements. No. The attorney did there. Uh, and and said the judge who 
Clemens said was unfair and compared him to Stalin and was a joy to practice in front of. Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of questions kind of at the next, what do the next steps look like and whether, you know, that will still be the attorney that represents him if they do file an appeal um, and get another trial. So, of course, we'll have more on this coming up today on 13 News at noon, 13 News at 3, 4, 5, 6 o'clock tonight. So thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Unscripted on 13+. Plus. Um, be sure that you have our mobile app and you're getting all the latest updates on this case and some of the other cases, including George Kelly, because we know mm -hmm. that tomorrow they will actually have jurors go to the ranch, um, George Kelly's ranch. So a lot of updates recently. Make sure you have our app, make sure you're subscribed to our notifications, and make sure that you're following along on our website. We hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thanks so much again for joining us, and have a great day.